So why am I here? Why should you trust me? So I'm here to show you how to put your users first. This is a pattern and a formula that I have used at companies that are different sizes, so small startups, big companies, banks, health and wellness companies, art organizations and wealth management companies. And I can tell you that from using this formula for about 10 years now that this formula works. So number one, our assumptions for today are customers are humans. And if that's all you're gonna walk away with, that's all I want you to remember. So, you know, shut the books, you can walk away. I know there's an accountant in the audience, so perhaps this is not music to his ears, but unlike what economists and people that play with numbers would argue, humans aren't always rational. We aren't utility optimizing individuals operating in a world of perfect information. So if we are designing for humans, what does that look like? <clears throat> so humans are busy. How does your solution make their life easier? That's the first thing we're gonna think about today. Humans are saturated. So how can we talk when they are listening and only when they are listening? Humans are emotional. So how do we make humans feel when we talk about our products? And humans are tribal. So what does your product connect them to that is greater than themselves? So if we believe these four assumptions, and these are assumptions, probably the first two are undeniable. You can buy into the third and the fourth somewhat, but they are assumptions that I'm posturing today to take you through the slides. Again, it is a philosophy, so you don't have to buy into it 100%, but if you wanna design products like I am suggesting that we do throughout this course, then these are the four assumptions we take in. So if we take on these assumptions, what does good product management look like in this context? So we're gonna take you through some best practice examples. Hopefully the examples that I show you through today are from companies that you already know. So number one, good product management means creating solutions that make customers' lives easier. So what does that mean? It means reframing your mindset to solve for a customer need. So the most famous example of product disruption is Uber. And what did they assume? In an old school world, companies like taxis thought that their customers said, I want a taxi. Actually, their customers say, my flight to Madrid is at midday, so I should get to the airport for 10 a.m. So what enables them to do that on demand? It's Uber. What are some other examples of this? And I purposely put up some examples that are not digital products, because sometimes we assume that product innovation is always digital. Um, the first example on your left is an example of a membership club and the tabs on the top are all the services that it provides its customers to be healthy so they are a membership service that enables the customer outcome and the customer outcome is to be healthy the product and services they provide to do so are a gym a spa a food a food food um, medical or GP services, events, so networking events, they provide content and essentially it's a membership club that's um, for, for females that charges £300 a month, so it's quite extensive. And, but what do they get from enabling the outcome? They are able to charge a premium for the package of putting it together. So what does a financial advisor do? A financial advisor talks to you about products that already exist in a way that you can understand. So if information was the answer, all we would need is the internet. Why do financial advisors exist? 
because they are able to help us digest content and tell us what product and services enable us to be financially secure. What does an interior designer do? So they put all the pieces together that we could do ourselves to give us a nice house. So what is the outcome that's being enabled here? A nice house or your dream home. If your house proud, you're gonna pay that premium, the convenience for enabling your need. Good product management is number two, talking to customers when they are listening. So what does that mean? It means identifying the contextual moments that matter most. And I'll show you some examples if that's too meta. So the first example on the left of a savings product by all the big banks, not just Lloyd, so not throwing them under the bus by any means, is they assume that customers want an ISA. So who wants an ISA? No one. They want what an ISA enables. A company on the right, which is an Australian company called, called Raise, says that its customers talk in the way that their customers talk. So I know I should save to keep a safety net, but I never get around to it. So what does that mean? They make the savings process as frictionless as spending. They inbuild the savings process into the spending process. So I don't need to know that I should get an ISA. I just need to know that I'm going to save the percentage of the roundup and then the functionality does the rest. So what does this product or service enable? It talks to us when we're in market to save and that's when we're spending. So these are some more examples, talking to customers when they are listening. On the left, I'm getting my left and right confused because it's the opposite way, but this is my favorite product management quote. So if information was the answer, we'd all be billionaires and have perfect abs. So why do we not? Because we're not rational, because we're lazy, because we can't imagine our future self. So in comparison, what does the company on the right do? So um, the example on the right hand side is a fitness blogger called Kayla Istinas. I think that's how you pronounce her name. And what she does is she says that I can tell you that these exercises are good for your arms. I can tell you that if you isolate muscle groups on different days, you get greater muscle tone. I can tell you that HIIT exercise is more effective for burning calories. And I can tell you that if you follow this plan in 28 days, you will get results. What she is also saying is you don't need to understand any of that. You just need to do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it. So what this is about is talking to customers in a way that gives them the minimum amount of information for the maximum benefit at the time that they are listening. So yeah, the, another obvious example is Netflix, but um, I don't think we need to explain that one. Content on demand. So number three, good product management is about creating solutions for those influenced by emotion. So this is probably one of the more controversial suggestions, but what I'm really saying here is we're trying to understand how customers want to feel when they make the transaction. Okay, so these are two active wear brands. And what the similarities here are, same material, same cut. Obviously it's a different pattern. I've chosen an extreme for the example on the left hand side. Same production. Same production location, what's the difference? It's the brand and it's the price that people will pay for that brand. So I'm not saying that consumers aren't driven by money. So there are lots of customers that are, but I am saying 
that you probably don't want to be targeting those customers. So how does Lululemon get away with charging a hundred pounds for a pair of polyester pants? And it's because how they make you feel. If you've been working out and doing potentially this plan, which I haven't done by the way, but it looks hard. You're like, yeah, I'm worth it. I want the hundred pound pants. I'm sorry, but the ones on the left are just really ugly, so no one's going to buy them. So these are some more examples, the prime example of brands that entice you in by the way they make you feel a cologne and perfume. So Lynx is such a great example of selling chemicals to teenage boys because it makes them attractive to the opposite sex. So Lynx costs absolutely nothing to make and they get away with the biggest markups because of their branding. This Chanel Coco Mademoiselle, um, that's French in a very Australian accent, so perhaps not exactly how you pronounce it, but their bottles are up to a hundred pounds. They probably cost one pound to make. So how is that possible? Um, everyone knows Nike. The middle example of a tea brand is something I'd really like to draw out because um, the Puka teas sell single serve herbs for half the price as they do for the mixed blends. So what they're saying here is you don't need to know that lavender is a sedative. You don't need to know that passion flower can help with sleep. You don't need to know that chamomile is a relaxant. We just need you to tell us how you want to feel and we'll charge you a premium for it. So number four, and this is probably the most controversial, but again, it's all part of a theory, is good product management is creating solutions that connects users to their tribe. So that means connecting users to your vision, but more importantly, to each other. So who in the audience wants to have a go at what this brand sells? Sneaker. Anything else? I won't give it away just yet. All stars. All stars? All sneakers. Is it a French brand? It is indeed. Oh, okay. I'm not sure how everyone knew it was sneakers, but I thought that was pretty Fair circumspect. Job. Have you worked with Beja? Yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Because I thought that, yeah, no one would get that, but you actually got the exact brand. So sneakers, all stars and the shoes. So perhaps not a great example, but what that was supposed to show is that it's ambiguous. So Beja, um, as has been pointed out, is a, is a company run as a social enterprise and they integrate social impact into their production line. But what they're really saying here is the shoes are a form of badging. So when you buy these shoes for a premium, you are saying that I care about the, the environment, I care about fair trade, um, and I care about saying that I care about those things. So you could argue this brand is the new Nike um, and they're wildly successful and you pay for it. Um, so these are great examples as well and for different reasons. The example on the left is a yoga studio that um, the first time I went to, I didn't really understand how everyone was friends in the yoga class. I actually thought I'd walked into the wrong class. But then when you come out, especially in London, I was like, everyone is so friendly, like what is going on? I come out afterwards and it become really apparent to me what they were doing. So um, Tri Yoga has a cafe, uh, it has a clothing store and it has um, like therapy and alternative therapies offered. So what happens is everyone goes to the class and then they come out afterwards and they have coffee together. So what they're selling here is not just yoga. 
they're selling the community. Um, the example on the right, everyone's aware of. So Apple, um, not only is a try, but I think what, what Apple do so well is they embed you within their ecosystem. So if you buy into their brand, you buy into everything. So because you are so embedded within all their products, perhaps you've set up an iCloud, you've got an iPhone now, it becomes too hard to switch to Android and it's not worth your time. So what does that mean? They can charge more for the convenience. So in summary, good product management is reframing your mindset to solve for a customer need. So not selling a product, enabling an outcome. So what you need to do is ask, <coughs> what do they need and what do they want to achieve? Good product management is identifying the contextual moments that matter. So that means when do they want to achieve it? So when are your customers actually listening? And it's not all the time. The third aspect is understanding how your customers or your consumers want to feel. So how do they want to feel once they have done the transaction and when they are using your product? And the fourth one, and this is the newest factor of my theory, is identifying how your vision connects users to their values and to each other. So why do they use your product or service at the time they do with the other people that use it? <coughs> so what am I really saying here? This is my philosophy and my theory of product management when it's done well. If you believe this philosophy, this is how you apply it in your company. And what you do when you apply that is you surface your consumers' drivers, and then you can create products that solve for that. So product features that connect users to a solution. So um, Future Super is an Australian company, and so I just put in the brackets there what it does. It's an ethical investment firm. Um, and essentially what they do is use their platform to divest from um, companies that don't have an ethical screen and reinvest that into companies that are making a positive difference. What I think is actually particularly important to call out here is as a platform, they enable individual users to feel like they are empowered to accelerate climate change action because together they're able to pull more funds out of polluting companies and into the right ones. So this is just a screenshot and it's fine if you can't read the text there, but asking the question number one, when we went through those examples, is what do they wanna achieve? And the four things here for the future super audience, so superannuation or investment audience, is they want financial security, and this is obviously not everyone, but four of the prime segments. Financial security, so tell me what to do and what I have achieved. The second audience wanted financial literacy and the way we talked to them was about empowering <coughs> them to understand what they are doing. That was about present tense. The third was financial well-being, so helping them to become so in the future to become stronger. And obviously that's why that persona was represented by the muscle man. And the fourth one was wealth for the family. So this is the carer persona. They want to share their knowledge with others. And why this fourth persona was really important because it's not actually common for financial firms to uh, enable you to onboard others. But what we identified through this process of customer mapping as it actually, we got a lot of parents or spouses wanting to onboard their spouse or their children, and we didn't enable that. And so once we'd examined that, that kind of subconscious decision when we didn't, there was no reason we didn't actually for risk reasons. If someone signed off, they could, they could onboard their spouse. Um, and so from re-examining those sub subconscious assumptions, we, will, we were able to onboard four people for the price of one. 
So what happens when you do this exercise is you identify personas. Um, you can then identify appropriate solutions and then res respective ways of achieving that. So I know that you can't read that text. That's just to show you a real high level screenshot of a way of doing that exercise. Asking question number three was how do they want to feel? And these were the four main answers. So similarly, financially secure, financially literate, the two different ones here were relieved that they had done their personal admin. And that's actually a big one for financial products. So people think that they should just have these things. So they've been told them over and over again. But this audience was kind of the one and done. They just wanted it done. They wanted that tick box exercise. The fourth audience, was was the most interesting because it was the audience we weren't talking to so they wanted to know that they're accelerating climate change action so what can an investment firm that has loads of customer details and everything about you on file do to enable this electronic petitions so as opposed to most investment funds that are a one and done that have really low engagement and probably don't have a mobile app Something that Future Super did really well was identify that their audience wanted more engagement on climate change. And so because they already had all your details, all you had to do was click appropriate boxes to sign petitions on climate change. So everyone in their user base was able to feel like they were accelerating climate change action. Um, this one's more comprehensive again, like lots of words on this slide. I don't need you to read through all of them. I'm just trying to show you what the exercise looks like. But for example, at Rise Art, which is another recent um, client of mine in London, is that one of their key audiences, why do people buy art, for example? And that's the first question. And there were five main incentives. It was to decorate, to invest, to collect, to educate or to learn. And what we identified um, with the collector and the investor audience is that audience was the most valuable but the most underserved by our platform. And the reason that they were underserved is someone that's investing needs to be able to sell on the artwork for more, <clears throat> at least the same or more value. But what they needed to do that was a certificate of authenticity and the artwork signed on the back. So unfortunately, as a marketplace, we didn't offer those services. But how much does that cost to provide? Probably nothing. So a project um, when I worked there was to enable a digital download of a PDF that said this artwork is authentic. And then we made it compulsory for the artist to sign all the artwork on the back. So that obviously uplift our sales significantly. And that kind of thinking where we reframe our mindset to look for the customer need means that we're able to identify those opportunities. So in summary, product management, my philosophy of product management is it is the continuous cycle of putting our customers first in a context where we acknowledge that customers are idiocentric humans. If we believe that philosophy, the method is we ask the right questions and then from doing so, we are provided a framework through which we can better understand our company and its customers. The outcome that we get as we surface our customers' underlying emotional drivers and then the solution is that product management enables you to identify features that connect users with your vision and each other so that they can live their values. So I believe that connection is the cure.